When I watched Kurt Warner, I thought he was the greatest pocket passer of all time. His accuracy, anticipation, ball placement, ability to hit receivers perfectly in stride, and his ability to throw with the pocket collapsing was something that I marveled at. From 1999 to 2001, Kurt Warner and the greatest show on turf was something amazing to watch with the rhythm, pace, explosiveness, and the ability to score at any moment. The greatest show on turf has its place in NFL history, but there was a lot that I would like to document that isn't well known about Warner and the potent Rams offense. So without further ado, 90 Sports and Soldier presents What You Didn't Know About Kurt Warner and the Greatest Show on Turf. When you look at the greats in NFL history, so many of them just happen to be at the right place at the right time with a seemingly perfect environment. Kurt Warner luckily happened to be in the perfect place at the perfect time with the Rams. And strangely, a good portion of that could be because of this franchise, the Chicago Bears. First in 1997, Kurt Warner was scheduled to have a tryout with the Chicago Bears. However, Warner had to cancel because he had a spider bite on his right arm. Possibly, Warner had a chance to make the Bears, but for whatever reasons, and with all the different GMs and coaches, Chicago has had a lousy history in terms of the quarterback play. But the second connection with the Bears and Warner having success in St. Louis has to do with the strangest coaching hiring blunder you will ever see. After the 1998 season, the Chicago Bears announced that Cardinals defensive coordinator Dave McGinnis would become the new head coach of the Chicago Bears, but McGinnis had not signed a contract yet and basically what happened thereafter was that McGinnis was in his Chicago hotel with his agent, looking over the contract which was a low ball offer. McGinnis declined to be the new Bears head coach and thus it was quite embarrassing for the Bears. The former Bears linebackers coach was not too pleased with the franchise due to the premature announcement. But if McGinnis would have become the Bears head coach, Mike Martz would have been the Bears offensive coordinator. Instead what happened, quarterback Trent Green left Washington and signed with the Rams. The quarterback's coach at Washington with Green was Mike Martz who became the Rams new offensive coordinator. Now you know all about Trent Green's injury which allowed Warner to get an opportunity. But when Warner finally got the chance to play, he happened to be in the perfect system for him. As a lot of Martz's system has to do with the quarterback dropping back, holding onto the ball while letting the route combinations develop, then throwing extremely accurate strikes with anticipation. This was perfect for Warner's quarterback talents. Furthermore, Warner had some tremendous talent to work with, with Marshall Falk, who had issues with missed practices in Indianapolis and would come over to the Rams in a trade. Wide receiver Isaac Bruce would be healthy in 1999 after some hamstring issues in the previous two seasons and with the sixth pick in the 1999 NFL Draft, the Rams selected the correct wide receiver for the March system in the faster and nimbler Torrey Holt rather than the bigger David Boston. The Rams third wideout, Oz Hakim, would have a breakout season and demonstrated his big play ability and Ricky Prohl was the best number four wide receiver in the NFL. This was the right place in the right time for Warner and the offensive weapons playing in the March system. At a time when quarterbacks weren't expected to play well in their first season as a starter, Warner came in and was tremendous. And around this time, before they called the greatest show on turf, the Rams were called the Warner Brothers. The Rams were blowing out their opponents and saw themselves at 6-0. Then the Rams lost at Tennessee and lost to a decent Detroit team on the road, but subsequently St. Louis went back to their blowout methods once again and ended with a 13-3 record. Kurt Warner ended up becoming only the second player to throw for at least 40 touchdowns in a season at the time. The other was Dan Marino. But these numbers could have been much greater, but instead the Rams got out to such big leads early and quickly, and thus the Rams would be running the ball more frequently in the second half. Heading into the playoffs, the negative with the Rams was they hadn't played anyone. Up first were the Minnesota Vikings who set the NFL scoring record during the previous season. Now if there was one play that epitomizes the greatest show on turf and what kind of a quarterback Kurt Warner was and what kind of playmakers the Rams had, it was the Rams' first play from scrimmage in the playoffs as Kurt Warner threw about a 33 yard dart on a deep in route perfectly right in stride to Isaac Bruce and in between a couple of defenders in which Isaac Bruce took to the house. This was Warner, this was the greatest show on turf. And if there was one quarter that really represented the Rams, it'd be the third quarter of this game as the Rams had an avalanche of points. The Rams had a touchdown celebration called a bob and weave, and they were bobbing and weaving a lot as Vikings coach Dennis Green looked on. In the offseason, Green, who is the co-chairman of the NFL Competition Committee, 
pushed for the ban on celebrations involving two or more players, which was passed 30 to 0 with the Rams not voting. But the Rams defeated the Minnesota Vikings. Then the Rams defeated the Bucks in the NFC Championship game, in which was one of the best defensive efforts ever by Tampa Bay. And then of course the Rams wound up winning the Super Bowl over the Tennessee Titans. However, afterwards, Dick Vermeil retired. It may have seemed like to several that he was pushed out so Mike Martz could become the new head coach. He was basically the coach in waiting and was going to be on top of everyone's list of head coaching candidates in the offseason. Nonetheless, the 2000 NFL season would be quite an entertaining one. For the 2000 season, the fastest offense got even faster by drafting running back Trum Candidate with the first round pick. When the Super Bowl winning Chiefs won their Super Bowl with their explosive offense, they drafted running back Clyde Edwards Hilaire with their first round pick. And the first thing I thought about was Trunk Candidate in 2000 draft, although they are different types of running backs. Anyways, for the first six games of the 2000 season, I thought this was where the greatest show on turf was at their best offensively. The offense looked unstoppable and once again, the Rams jumped out to another 6-0 start. The only slight knock was that Warner's interception rate would be increasing, but still the Rams were so clockwork potent. But on the other hand, the defense was giving up a lot of yards and points. Two quick notes to make here. Mike Martz did an unprecedented move by giving the team a whole week off during their bye week after a 57-31 win against the San Diego Chargers. Then for their very next game against Atlanta, it was the first time in NFL history where a game started off with back-to-back -back kickoff return touchdowns. Also during this game, Rams kicker Jeff Wilkins injured a quadriceps muscle, so the Rams were without a kicker, which led to the Rams having to go for it on fourth down in field goal territory, which led to touchdowns and Rams also converted on 4 of 5 two-point conversions. But in a week 8 matchup at Kansas City, St. Louis lost badly. In this game, Kurt Warner broke his right little finger on his passing hand after receiving a snap awkwardly while under center. Warner would be sidelined and this would also be the start of finger problems for Warner in which I'll talk about more later on. Trent Green would fill in and he actually had a better passer rating than Warner in 2000. However, the offense was still good, but it didn't seem the same. It didn't have that same rhythm, explosiveness, and pace that it had with Warner. The Rams would find themselves at 8-4, but number 13 would return in a Week 14 matchup at Carolina. However, it seemed like Warner showed some rust as the Rams lost 17-3 with Warner throwing 4 interceptions. But number 13 was extremely sharp in his next game, throwing his usual accurate darts against the Vikings. St. Louis won. And also, eight players were fined for doing the bob and weave celebration with Dennis Green on the opposing sideline. Then St. Louis would lose in one of the most entertaining games I've ever seen against the Bucks. This loss put the Rams at 9-6 with one game left, but didn't control their own destiny to make the postseason. If Detroit won at home against the 4-11 Chicago Bears, St. Louis would be home for the playoffs. Meanwhile, the Rams had to defeat the Saints on the road. New Orleans was still in contention to get the top overall seed in the NFC. This was before all the Week 17 schedule maneuvering nowadays, so both of these games kicked off around the 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time mark. Kurt Warner got knocked out with a concussion. In the third quarter, the Rams won as this game ended a bit earlier than the Lions game. Subsequently, rookie Bears kicker Paul Edinger kicked a 54-yard field goal with two seconds left and thus sent the Rams to the playoffs where they will coincidentally play the Saints again in New Orleans. As you could imagine, this Rams team was not your normal six-seeded playoff team. But strangely, after a first quarter touchdown drive, the Rams offense would not be in sync and totally out of rhythm. St. Louis found themselves down 31-7 with under 12 minutes to play. Luckily for the Rams, Marshall Falk was tremendous in the fourth quarter and Warner was dropping dimes. Very quickly, the Rams were only down 31-28. With under two minutes to play, St. Louis's defense was able to force the Saints to have to punt the ball, and at this point, with the way the Rams offense was working in the fourth quarter, I think an overwhelming amount of people who were watching this game were thinking that the Rams going to score and win. Unfortunately, Asakim muffed the punt, New Orleans recovered, thus leading to the Saints winning their first playoff game ever. Enter the 2001 season. Lovey Smith would be the new defensive coordinator 
and he did a tremendous job in St. Louis. The defense added a lot more speed. Warner would be back healthy, and the Rams would be Super Bowl favorites. The 2001 season started in Philadelphia, where the Eagles had a great secondary and a great defensive coordinator. St. Louis won 20-17. Now their low scoring output wasn't because the offense played badly, but mainly because Philly's D was really good. Warner made a beautiful pass in between a safety and cornerback to set up the game winning field goal. Then the Rams won at San Fran. Then the Rams offense was really brilliant against a very good Miami defense with Zach Thomas and Jason Taylor and corners who could cover. This was then followed by a shutout over the Detroit Lions. The Rams only ran the ball three times in the first half. Next up were the Giants and Michael Strahan was all over Warner who was knocked out for a play as the Rams could only score 15 points but one. This was then followed by an easy victory over the Jets and for a third year in a row the Rams started off the season 6-0. Next up the rivals at home the New Orleans Saints who was a trendy pick to win the Super Bowl in 2001. The Rams were up by 18 points but the Saints came back. John Carney kicked a 27 yard field goal with a second left to give the Saints the 34-31 victory. And what's amazing about this is that the Rams lost to a late field goal despite turning the ball over a whopping 8 times. This was a fun rivalry between the Saints and the Rams for a couple of years. The Rams then had a bye week but then the Rams destroyed a beat up Carolina Panthers team that frankly wasn't very good at all. Falk was tremendous but Warner was not. And I think around this time there was some concern. As I mentioned earlier, Warner was perfect for the March system, but playing in the March system also meant standing in the pocket and getting beat up. As a result, Warner would get his throwing hand dinged up at times by the likes of defensive players' helmets and bodies. In this game against Carolina, Warner said he was bothered by a sprained thumb that he suffered in the opening week as it didn't quite fully heal yet. But Warner did bounce back the next week at New England. St. Louis won this game but lost the following week once more to the Buccaneers at home. And the Bucs really played well once again on defense, but St. Louis would go on to win their next six, including a win over the rivals of Saints and had a win over the Colts where the offense just looked phenomenal. Warner was named MVP once again but suffered a throat injury in the season finale against Atlanta. Doctors discovered bleeding from the vocal cords, but with a week off, Warner and the Rams would be ready. In the divisional round, they would face the Green Bay Packers. Prior to this game, Bill Parcells on a radio show segment with Sean McDonough really thought highly of this Packers defense. Parcells thought the Packers secondary had the speed to stay with the Rams and didn't expect a blowout. He was right about the Packers defense as they were with the Rams wide receivers that tackled well, contested several passes, and made it hard for the Rams to gain yards. There was one really nice dime Warner through to Holt, but the Packers secondary, they played well. Now this game did end up in a blowout, but it was basically due to Favre's six interceptions. I thought the Packers deep played well, as they didn't allow the greatest show on turf to have good rhythm. And Warner, he didn't seem like the typical Kurt Warner, but the Rams would win. Next up, Philadelphia and the NFC Championship game, and Marshall Falk ran the ball 31 times. Warner was efficient, but to me, Warner just didn't seem like the typical Kurt Warner throwing those intermediate and deep strikes. Nonetheless, the Rams would head back to the Super Bowl and would be heavy favorites against the New England Patriots. Now I want to start off by talking about Bill Belichick's game plan. When the Giants upset the Bills in Super Bowl 25, Belichick, who was the Giants defensive coordinator, had a game plan to basically not worry about the Hall of Fame running back Thurman Thomas getting yards, and instead wanted to be physical with their Hall of Fame wide receivers and Andre Reid and James Lofton and not let them get big plays. This game plan would basically be the same against the Rams and their Hall of Famers on offense. During the game, the Rams would be getting yards and be driving the ball, but only had three points through three quarters. Warner's starting right tackle was out for the game as a backup missed a block in which perhaps led to a pick six, but the Rams were able to get two touchdowns in the fourth and tied up at 17. But with under a minute 30, Brady drove the Patriots down for the game winning field goal. During that drive, there were three questionable calls that favored the Pats that were not mentioned on the broadcast. Like did J.R. Redmond actually get out of bounds? Where's the intentional grounding penalty? And how does a 48 yard field goal take seven seconds? Nonetheless, the Patriots won. Martz was criticized for not running the ball more with Marshall Falk. But in the aftermath, questions arose about how legitimate this Super Bowl win was for New England. Players and others had their suspicions. For the 2002 season, the Rams were Super Bowl favorites. But for me, 
I question how healthy Warner's hand was seeing him play in the three playoff games, although the Rams did play three good secondaries. But Warner didn't look like the typical Kurt Warner in regards to being able to throw intermediate and deep passes on a more consistent basis or at least trying to attempt these passes. His pass attempts were getting shorter, but I guess a full offseason would help the Rams, but that was not the case, as Warner was not good during his first four games. Against Dallas, Warner broke a finger on his throwing hand. Questions were arising in terms of what was wrong with the Rams. Is it the old line? Did Isaac Bruce lose a step? But in fact, number 13 was not the same dynamic thrower. His hand was not close to being 100%. The Rams started 0-5, but Mark Bolger came in and played well which resulted in the Rams being even at 5-5. Warner would return against Washington and frankly, Bolger was a better quarterback and should have never been replaced. Nonetheless, Warner would get two more starts and lose them both and his hand and fingers seemed so messed up where he couldn't really throw the ball deep or on several intermediate routes. What I was hearing was that Warner was playing because Martz wanted to open the playbook up more, but not really sure if that was the reason why Bolger was not playing. For the 2003 season, Warner would start the season opener. He fumbled the ball six times as he had issues gripping the ball and was replaced by Bolger for good. Bolger led the Rams to a 12-4 record but were upset by the Panthers in the playoffs and this was basically the end of the greatest show on turf. Kurt Warner would get released by the Rams. He then signed with the Giants but he wasn't the same quarterback there due to his damaged hand. Warner then went on to Arizona and still wasn't the same quarterback and was mostly throwing shorter passes but things would change. Warner would revitalize his career. After spending two years in the desert, for the 2007 season, Warner would switch to wearing gloves and thus, he could grip the ball and throw his trademark accurate strikes all over the field. Warner played really well in 2007. Then for the 2008 season, Warner showed he was back as the Cardinals made the playoffs. However, there were people saying that this was one of the worst teams to make it to the NFL postseason. A lot of that was probably due to a horrible effort in a Week 16 matchup at New England in snowy conditions. However, the cards were in the postseason, and admittedly, in a way they had some favorable things go their way. First, the Cardinals were able to host a home playoff game despite the Falcons having a better record. Warner made a nice third down throw to seal the victory for the cards. Then in the divisional matchup, Warner and Larry Fitzgerald played well, but Jake DeLome was horrible at home which resulted in an Arizona win. For the NFC Championship game, the Cards were able to host this game because the six-seeded Eagles upset the top-seeded Giants. Honestly, it would have seemed like a very tough task for the Cardinals to go up to New York in unfavorable conditions and win. Nonetheless, the Cardinals hosted the Eagles who had a better regular season record than Arizona, but Arizona won their division and the Cardinals defeated the Eagles and would play Pittsburgh in the Super Bowl. Now I know it takes a lot to get to a Super Bowl and I never want to discredit a team's run but they did have a favorable path to Tampa. But unfortunately, Pittsburgh would win after Warner brought the Cardinals back. But the defense was probably gassed on the Steelers game winning final possession. And sorry to nitpick, but why was there not a review on this play that was called a fumble? Anyways, Warner and the Cardinals would be back in 2009. Kurt really played well once again. Just a quick game of note, in week eight, Warner threw five interceptions against Carolina. But for the very next game, Warner came back throwing five touchdown passes against the Bears, despite not having Anquan Bolden. The Cards won their division again. Then in the wild card round, just a magnificent display of offensive talent between the Packers and the Cardinals. If you want to see what the best offensive talent is at its best, this game had it. Now I understand the Packers had some blown coverages, but there were some nice dimes dropped by Warner and Aaron Rodgers and some artistically tremendous catches made by the wide receivers. The Cardinals won, but would get blown out by the Saints the following week in New Orleans. This would be Warner's last NFL game. Interestingly, his career playoff record is 9-4, with three of those losses happening at the Superdome. One last stat that I'd like to point out, and it's probably coincidental, but whenever Warner had a season where he played all 16 games, his team went to the Super Bowl that season. During the 2003 AFC Championship game, the Patriots once again were physical with the talented Colts receivers and kind of embarrassed Indy's offense. As a result, the NFL began enforcing illegal contact and it's been part of the reason for passing statistics and passer ratings improving. But can you imagine what the greatest show on turf would be able to do if illegal contact by the defensive backs was enforced? 
And can you imagine if Warner was able to stay healthy or have been able to find the comfort of wearing gloves sooner while with the Rams? Statistically, some offenses might be better, but in essence and looking at the bigger picture, I think when Warner was healthy, the greatest show on turf was the greatest NFL offense. Furthermore, for the March system, there were no audibles as everyone had to make the same read on the field and make the same adjustments, which was also amazing about this offense. As for Warner, I do understand why those might not think he's a Hall of Famer, as he had quite a unique career with his best years coming at the beginning and the end of his career. But when watching a healthy Warner, all I can say is wow, his accuracy, anticipation, toughness, and his ability to just drop dimes under pressure is the best ever, in my humble opinion. Real quick, I just want to thank all those who have supported 90 Sports Nostalgia. Don't forget to subscribe, like, comment, share, and check out the links below for Patreon and merch. Thank you so much. What you didn't know about Kurt Warner and the greatest show on turf.